Ukrainians are one of our closest neighbors and also very close in uh, in our trading patterns. Uh, we spend something like 10 to 11 million tons of um, Ukrainian maize in European agriculture, mainly feeding animals, but also processing into other commodities and other products. Um, we also trade with Ukraine. Um, they buy our goods. And uh, we are we actually are hoping that uh, these trade relations would develop favorably to both directions. And uh, in this respect, this is a, another misfortune, uh, bad development of international relations when, when we lose uh, our Ukrainian trade as it stood only until quite recently. So to what percentage would you say uh, Europe is reliant on Ukrainian agriculture in terms of wheat to begin with? Well, we are not that much dependent on wheat because basically this is um, um, a product that is consumed mainly in other parts of the world. Uh, we are trading wheat also from Europe and we are one of the big traders uh, as European Union. Most of the wheat that Ukraine produces goes to third countries such as North Africa, Egypt and Middle East. And uh, therefore it is uh, important for us in Europe to consider the third country consequences of the ongoing crisis. And this we consider also very important in Europe. We need to carry out weight so that we would not be um, endangering uh, the supplies that are going to be diminishing of obvious reasons uh, from Ukraine. And therefore, European Union must put up an act to make sure that we have um, stable supplies of food, agricultural commodities to the market. Are you, you concerned that Ukraine may not be able to plant crops, uh, certainly in time for this year's harvest? Well, we are indeed uh, quite worried about this and mainly for the instability that that would create to the international market. However, we, we need to also consider this in a more nuanced manner. Um, while the eastern Ukraine and the, the territories that are directly under the military action, uh, Russian troops invading Ukraine, would most probably find it very difficult to, to maintain the agricultural activity. But then in the western part, in the central part of Ukraine, and especially the closer to the EU borders, we still have some um, a margin of maneuver, and especially when it comes to reallocation of Ukrainian own production plants and their resourcing, especially from partly from maize to wheat and especially underlying the importance of uh, vegetable production, which is uh, substantial also in Ukrainian agriculture. So we see some opportunities for the Ukrainian farmers to reassess their production plans, and we would hope that they would actually do that primarily for their own reasons, supplying their own markets for their food security, but also partially to offset some of the consequences that we have seen now uh, uh, due to the Russian aggression. Do you think they're capable of doing that at this time? Well, farmers all over the place, and not only Ukraine, but also globally speaking, are quite resilient people when it comes to uh, reorganizing themselves. Uh, we have uh, reason to believe that they do not have a full set of inputs, but this is the same also in here in the European Union and European, uh, European Union farmers. We do not have the full volume of fertilizers. We have very high prices of fertilizers. We have very high prices of fuel. Um, also in Ukraine, they have lost a big part of their inputs, especially if diesel fuel has been taken over by the military. And then uh, most probably there will be huge risks in the distribution of uh, fuel in, in future. So most probably they will have these bottlenecks. But fundamentally, we believe that the, the Ukrainian farmers, like any farmer globally, would do their utmost to offset these consequences as much as they can. And we have reason to believe that they will be eventually able to, to produce at least to a certain extent so that we would, uh, we would avoid the, the famous uh, 1930s famine that was actually quite devastating for the Ukrainian people. You mentioned costs, Pekka. I mean, the cost of fertilizer and feed have almost doubled, haven't they? Um, uh, they are still facing real problems with planning for the future, with costs rising as fast as they are. And will they continue to rise, do you think? It's difficult to say about the future. We have seen some stabilizing of the fuel market, and especially consumer prices uh, markets that we each and everyone have seen. But then uh, uh, the reality is that uh, we would not go back to the to the to the era 
uh, before the war, most probably we would have higher prices, especially for energy. Uh, we will most probably have higher prices for fertilizers as we are dependent on the Russian imports, both in, in the fertilizers themselves, but also uh, when it comes to nitrogen fertilizers uh, in uh, natural gas. So we have reason to believe that we have to get adapted to the new situation. And that opens also, while it is difficult for us, that opens new opportunities for European farming sector to provide assistance to the site when it comes to other uh, sourcing. And typically, we are very much motivated to take a look into how can we use our resources for, for renewable energy, for instance, because um, quite famously, everybody wants to get out of dependency on Russian uh, imports. And uh, there we can also develop new technologies, new ways of uh, developing agricultural activity where we could actually play a constructive role in European agriculture and also with our partners internationally. We have been promoting this in the past and we will be most probably doing this now in concrete terms because of the consequences to the marketplace. Is, is that what you meant, Pekka, when you said um, you need a food shield to counter Russia's use of food security as a weapon? Or, 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 what, what do you mean by that? We need to increase our resilience. We need to increase our inde independence. It doesn't mean that we step away from international trade and uh, stop trading with our partners, but we need to be much more dependent in what we do. And this requires certain tolerances to be f further developed, especially in, in the case of energy and in uh, critical supplies, such as fertilizers, also to a certain extent when it comes to pesticides, but also we need to assess and reassess our policies in the EU. How can we actually offset these changes through other means? And by this, I mean that instead of using fertilizers, can we come up with some other alternative sourcing? Can we come up with a mix of products that actually could, could enable farmers to continue their activities and produce that famously um, uh, popular protein crops, and especially for human consumption? But it's more to do with the, how the market reality and how the consumer market would act in relation of, of these changes. We have been very supportive for organic sector, but then organic sector is not going to be a full-scale solution for European agriculture, but we not, have to sustain its in, economic in short, viability. Certainly not in the short term. I, I, wonder, no. uh, I, I wonder if European farmers are able to help their Ukrainian counterparts. We have made some donations. We have actually financially... Many members of ours have actually donated financial resources to these efforts. Uh, we have received also a substantial list of um, uh, products or inputs that our colleagues are interested in, in having uh, to sustain their agricultural activity. We are looking into that uh, as we speak together with other stakeholders and the institutions, how we can materialize this in concrete actions and how soon can we actually deliver those those goods and how that would work in practice. But as you could imagine, we're talking about thousands of kilometers, transports, logistics, value-added products would be most probably the, the obvious target, but then how to do it without creating another requirement for the, uh, for the let's say, uh, the, the, the sparse resources that, uh, the scarce resources that we have in our logistics. Can we only, um, let's say, send a truck truck full of goods to the Polish border and trust that someone when someone will take it over. Um, no, this is not the way to do it. We need to secure the, the, the recipient. We need to work with our Ukrainian colleagues and their administration. We need to secure the logistical uh, chains, channels that we work, work with. We need to coordinate this with our European stakeholder colleagues, and we need to coordinate this uh, specifically with European Union institutions, especially the Commission. So the work is ongoing, and um, to a big part of that, that would be very concrete. As we all know, food and agriculture supply chains have been severely impacted uh, because of COVID. Did the lesson you learnt from COVID or the lessons you're learning from COVID uh, help you cope with this latest emergency? Or are you talking about a giant reset for the farming communities across Europe? I shouldn't say this, but we, we got lucky. We cut COVID-19 and, in fact, nobody's talking about COVID-19 anymore. Um, but then the, the lesson that we learned is actually what we uh, 
what we can deliver the resilience of agri food chain in the EU and globally. We had major bottlenecks with the COVID-19 first, first stage, uh, when the member states were closing the borders, there were restrictions for movement of people and goods. Um, there were desperate attempts to secure some societies from uh, exposure to the disease. Um, however, together with other stakeholders, our uh, food industry, uh, input industries, farming community, cooperatives, retailers, catering, as much as was left, um, we managed to come up with the, with the systems that actually secured uh, the flow of critically important import, uh, inputs to agriculture sector, including uh, labor force, seasonal labor. Actually, we could actually return back to, if not normal, but at least to the critical minimum vol volume of people working abroad. Uh, we work together with member states, uh, authorities and the commission, civil servants, commission departments. And I'm very proud to say that we actually managed to offset most of the difficulties that we faced in the very first part of the COVID-19 crisis. And that is the important uh, lesson that we learned from the previous two years that we can actually deliver, but it requires uh, joint action all along the line. And uh, this is where we actually proved Proved to be good at. Pekka Persson, many thanks to you for joining us here on the agenda. It's such a pleasure.